AIDS had been an infection of despair in our community. A despair that has the dangerous potential of leading to despondency and then to hopelessness. Our enemies certainly use AIDS in attempt to kill our gay hope. They suggest that AIDS is God's punishment, that we deserve AIDS for our wanton sexuality. Certainly AIDS and HIV-related illness continue to exact a tragic toll on our community. As we mourn and grieve over one another of our sisters and brothers, we all, both individually and as a community, can be overwhelmed with despair. But even in that overwhelming despair, we can see hope. We can see that that which was desired is now possible. AIDS is not an automatic death notice. It is possible to survive with AIDS. There are people living with AIDS and HIV infection. We do not have to give in to despair. As others have pointed out, AIDS as a symbol represents a challenge to gay people. By injecting us with despair, AIDS challenges us to renew our hope. By bringing out our enemies, AIDS challenges us to continue to fight for our liberation. There is a way to meet that challenge. There is an antidote to despair. We can act. We can act up. We can empower ourselves and our community to continue the process of our liberation. The lessons are all around us. Liberation is never given to a people. Liberation is the product of struggle, the reward of action. The power to drive that action is within ourselves. As each one of us is empowered, then our community can be empowered. We can unleash our power. We celebrate Stonewall. We celebrate the advent of gay hope. And as we go beyond this weekend, as we go beyond celebration, we must act to make real that which we now know is possible. In closing, I would like to leave you with an image that I found in a quote that was used by Leo Biscaglia in a book. We are each of us angels with one wing. We can only fly embracing each other. Thank you very much. This is the true legacy of Stonewall, to build a movement that is home for every last person who is queer, which means people of color, American Indians, Latinos, Asian Americans, Pacific Island, Islanders, Arab Americans, African Americans, Jews, working poor people, working class people, homeless people, people with AIDS, differently abled people, elders, and many more besides. And you can't build a movement that's home for everybody by merely turning your attention to eradicating oppressive attitudes within our lesbian and gay movement. It's not enough, for example, to explore, to explore your own racism and to make sure you watch yourself when you're interacting with people of color. The only way to attack, transform, and ultimately dismantle racism is to attack it root and branch, which means institutionally and the society as a whole. What this means, <clears throat> what this means, quiet as it's kept, is that the lesbian and gay movement has got to concern itself with racism as it destroys the lives of non-lesbian and non-gay people of color, women, men, and children. The only way to eradicate racism and class oppression and all the other isms within our movement is to dismantle them and the society as a whole. The course of the AIDS epidemic, which we are now fighting so valiantly, perfectly illustrates 
how all of these oppressions are tied together and why we must confront them simultaneously. AIDS has exposed a health care system that serves almost no one, a health care system that is based upon profit. We need to understand, painful as it is, why a white man with AIDS generally lives for a period of several years, while a black or Latino person with AIDS usually only survives a few months. We have got to change. We're not there yet. As someone who is officially middle-aged, I'm glad to know I can still change. It should delight us that in the words of a black minister from long ago, we're not where we want to be, we're not where we're going to be, but thank God we are not where we were. <clears throat> people of one great moment of history. We are a people whose courage has been tested through the generations. The one demand that is made on us is to be seen and heard for what we are. Women who make love with women and men who make love with men. As we gather in greater and greater numbers, so do those who hate us, those who would watch us die rather than touch our bodies, those who call our art a moral pollutant and want it pulled from their museums, those who want us to be sexually controlled and domesticated and yet declare our relationships illegal. Our most courageous answer to this barrage of exclusion is to go on living our lives without betrayal of our diversity, of our knowledge of our people's history, and our way of loving. You are the spirit of Stonewall. You, your faces, words, touches, are the living legacy of our people's history. But I wouldn't deny it, even though I was getting my brains beaten out, I would never stand up and say, no, don't hit me, I'm not gay, I'm not gay, I wouldn't do that. Gay America, wonderful. <laughs> Paid off getting my ass kicked. Remembering the stone wall.
while the Stonewall riots were happening, gay liberation was being born, I was being shuttled off to Camp Runamuck. What can I say? I missed a good time even back then. But not quite four years later, I began an incarceration at a proper boys boarding school in Connecticut. I knew I liked boys. I thought I was homosexual, but I didn't think I was gay. I didn't know if I was really enjoying myself. But, you know, I would take the train from Brooklyn, the IRT number two, and we'd rattle past the Christopher Street stop. And I'd see Christopher Street, and I would know, God, you know, I'd have fun if I got off here. I'd be gay if I got off at Christopher Street. I never made that detour. I graduated prep school. Come loudly, oh, excuse me, come loudy, no less. Anyway, I was 18 when that all happened. I knew there was a real big gay world out there. I wanted to explore it. I figured, shit, I could be a hairdresser to hell with college. That's what boys like me did, you know, burn hair. Mother wouldn't hear of it. So um, I went to college. I chose a school out in Southern California because I knew LA, God, you could be real gay in LA. So I went to LA. Unfortunately, I chose a really very conservative men's college out there. What can I say? I like boys. But, you know, I had lots of surprises. I picked this co uh, college from a catalog, so I didn't know much about it. When I got there, I found out they had a gay students' union. Honey, it was very popular, and so was I. We were having a real good time. Mother still wouldn't hear of it. Anyway, I came home for the summer vacation, and I began exploring the village. Christopher Street was everything, absolutely everything I'd imagined it would be when I was going to prep school. By the time I was 20, I actually celebrated my first Gay Pride Day. I was having incredible amounts of fun. And I, I really knew I was gay by that point. By the time I was 25, I actually marched in the parade. It had finally gone down Fifth Avenue. I was a young Upper East Sider, so that was much more convenient. And honey, I was getting gayer by the minute. What could be better? I mean, nothing could be better, I thought, but who knew? This is the third Pride Parade and festivities that I'm officially a part of. I, I just, it, that's incredible for me to believe. I see you all, and I want to thank all of you who watch me on television, on Gay Cable Network, for the support and the love that you give to me. And I just want to thank you all for letting me able to do this for you. Before the day is over, I want to wish you all a very gay weekend yes. and be well. Or should I say, have a well weekend and be gay. Yes. Thanks so much. See you tomorrow walking down Fifth Avenue. Bye-bye. Thank you.